Hey everybody, welcome to TCP Talks with Jonathan Baker and Justin Broadley from The Cloud Pod. In this series, we're bringing you interviews with the best and brightest leaders and heroes from the tech and cloud industry. Hey Jonathan, how's it going? Another time for TCP Talks. Good stuff. You know, just in cost of cloud has been on my mind a lot recently. We spent a lot of effort looking for savings on our AWS bill. Who can we talk to to help us with this? Well, I found a fantastic guest for you, Jonathan. Rob Martin. He's the FinOps principal in the practice management group at Aptio. Uh, of course, Aptio uh, purchased Cloudability, uh, where Rob was at, uh, and so he's here today to talk all about cloud cost management. Excellent. And we should get right into that show because I think it's fantastic. Welcome to the show, Rob. Thank you. You want to do a quick introduction for our listeners who are not uh, familiar with you on our, our Slack channel uh, or on the web or the things that you do with Cloudability. Maybe you can introduce yourself uh, for okay. those, those folks. My name is Rob Martin. I am with uh, Aptio Cloudability, and I'm a FinOps principal. So typically, uh, we're working with customers who are adopting FinOps, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about exactly what FinOps is, uh, who are trying to incorporate uh, cloud cost management and cloud uh, usage visibility and things like that into their existing businesses. So it's a little bit of consulting, a little bit of finance, and a, and a little bit of cloud all rolled into one. Where did the FinOps name come from? It is sort of a cloudability invention, is it not? It's probably popularized by, by cloudability. I think a couple of people were using it to, uh, for, for different things before we started. But the FinOps Foundation was actually formed in March of 2019. So that was when uh, that launched. It was uh, launched in San Francisco. Uh, and it began to, we began to roll out the, the, the name uh, along with that foundation. So the foundation was initially supported by CloudAbility. The foundation is, a, is actually a C, uh, 501c6, so it's a trade organization, but it's a nonprofit. And so it started off with about 35 members. Now it's got over 700 members. And uh, it's really the, the repository for, for forming uh, the, the practices and the, and the principles behind FinOps. Oh, nice. So you can find that at FinOps.org. Correct. Yeah. FinOps.org is where you can go. And anyone who is interested in uh, or doing FinOps in their organization can go there and join as a member. You get access to a FinOps Foundation Slack channel where you can share a lot of information with others. There are biweekly or so calls. And then there are a number of, uh, of other things coming up, uh, training uh, sessions to get certified as a FinOps practitioner. Uh, I'm doing a training course uh, next week on that as well. So uh, lots of opportunities for, for learning there. Oh, awesome. I should have known about that three months ago when we started our, uh, our sort of significant cost reduction uh, efforts. Yes. Well, it's never too late. In fact, most of the people who join, the biggest uh, story we get is that I, I just found the FinOps Foundation and just realized that what I've been doing all this time was actually FinOps. I wonder um, how many people are reinventing the same tool and go over and over again. Is it a place to go where, where people can share tools and, uh, and strategies or it's the real purpose of the organization? The biggest purpose of it is to share best practices. So FinOps is, is really uh, a, a growing, a new, a new thing, but it's growing in, pop, in popularity and, and, and in need. Um, I guess maybe we should talk a little bit about what sort of what FinOps is to, to set the stage. But, you know, in the, in the old days when everyone bought their, their data center infrastructure on an annual cycle or a five-year plan and you would, you would spend these enormous amounts of money to buy stuff that you were installing into your data centers, that money sort of disappeared and became funny money because it was never accounted for in the daily operations of your of your business. So if you were to use something really inefficiently or use something really efficiently, it really didn't make any difference to the organization. The introduction of DevOps, which really sped up the pace at which IT was able to build and deliver value through uh, IT uh, to customers, drew uh, the cloud providers to create these on-demand services that could be that could be instantiated essentially by the engineers themselves without going through procurement. And so uh, as, as DevOps began to, to, to take hold and as agile processes became, to, became more, more prevalent, you started to see more companies uh, lose control of how they were buying their IT or how they were buying their technology uh, because engineers were building that stuff uh, directly. They weren't going through the, the old proper channels. And so 
companies who have tackled that were doing essentially fin that FinOps job of bringing back together uh, IT, finance, and the business to sort of tackle that problem together to collaborate on how to manage the costs of IT and the costs of cloud uh, to really direct them towards the biggest business value. And so, uh, so FinOps is uh, essentially a set of processes, a set of tools uh, that, that you can use to, to do that job. And the biggest advantage for FinOps Foundation members is really to be able to share those experiences. So do you feel that if someone's practicing FinOps in an organization, they're coming from previously a different type of role? Um, I know a lot of times we talk about DevOps versus SRE, and you know those are kind of system engineers who had a development background to automate a lot of things, and then someone wrote a DevOps manifesto, and they became DevOps people. And then you know Google writes a book on SRE, and they become SRE people. Is this really kind of a redefinition of an existing role that was sort of in IT to be FinOps that's more cloud-friendly, or is this something completely new? I think it's, in a large degree, uh, a new phenomenon. So I, I had worked uh, previously at Accenture for a long time. I worked at the Department of Justice for a long time. We were doing big systems, you know, big, uh, gigantic, uh, largely Microsoft-based systems for, for huge enterprise needs. And the thing that struck me when I started to do more cloud stuff was that as a CIO, I could never go back and do anything about that stuff that I had purchased in the data center before. But what the cloud allows me to do is go back and repurchase every single piece of equipment, every single network connection that I have in my data center every single day if I want to. I can buy it in a different place, I can buy it in a different size, I can buy it in a different flavor or a different scale. And that's a new capability that I never had before as a CIO. The ideas that FinOps brings to an IT finance organization or to an organization as a whole is that you can't just buy stuff and then use it to the best of your ability and, and shrug your shoulders and, and try again next year. Uh, you really have to manage that investment and the, the investment that you're making second by second, hour by hour in the cloud, in this variable spend model. You've got to manage that in real time. You've got to manage it continuously. And that's not something I think that most CIOs either had the ability to do before and, and, and many do not have the ability to do it now. I think that almost every company in the in the world is going to need to have this discipline in place to some degree or other, which is why it, it was an appealing career move for me to, to come to CloudAbility when I did a year or so ago. I often hear that the cloud's a cheap place to go and run virtual servers, and uh, other people say that it's surprisingly expensive when you get there. Do you think the cloud is a more efficient place to to run compute? Is it is it really just um, people forget the expense they've, they've already committed to in private data centers when, when they're comparing things? Yeah, the cloud can certainly be a cheaper place to run things. But I think what we're seeing is a move away from the focus on cost savings and uh, a more of a focus on uh, using the cloud and using the variable cost model of the cloud as an innovation driver. So the biggest companies who are getting benefit out of the cloud are not getting those benefits from saving 30% or 20% or whatever percent off of what they were paying in their data centers. They're getting the advantage from being able to launch services at a global scale really quickly while using managed services on the back end of what they're doing to, to make their developers more efficient. That's where the big money is. Every company who's moved to the cloud has got a story about having moved something they thought was going to save money and it ended up costing them twice as much. Yeah. Um, that Just the ubiquity of that story uh, should be the caution for anybody who's considering that. But it certainly shouldn't keep you from considering using the cloud for that innovative advantage that you can get from it. I typically see you know, companies run to the cloud with this very lift and shift mentality, then they're shocked at how more expensive it is. Or, yeah. And and ultimately those costs when you when you back out, you know, cost of labor, cost of infrastructure, all those things that are on your on-premise data center, the cost is is more expensive, but it's a premium you're willing to pay because of what it gets you when not having to hire, you know, VMware experts and storage experts and network experts at that level. You can hire a certain different class of those type of people. Um but it's interesting because what I do hear a lot is that this is an Amazon thing. You know, everyone who's on Amazon complains about cost and complains about cost management and the overall direction of cost. But I don't hear those angry mobs complaining about GCP and Azure cost issues as much. So do you think it's a, a reflection of Amazon's model? Is it a volume thing? There's just more customers on AWS? Or do you think it's it's an upcoming problem for both GCP and Azure? It's just we're too early. That's actually a good question. I, I think it's a problem for all three hyperscale providers. Um I think that there's a big difference right now in terms of the you know the the typical AWS customer and the typical Azure customer. There are probably not enough GCP customers, you know, huge uh, 
GCP customers to uh, to know there yet. And, and GCP is is having the advantage of being behind, uh, of coming from behind and being able to learn from the mistakes or the or the the wins that AWS and Azure have had. But I think that uh, you know Azure has uh, a following and has a, a user base that tends to be more coming from their uh, from a large infrastructure of of Microsoft enterprise software on-prem, right? And those are the those tend to be the customers who do that. So um, complaining about cost is something that's largely, at least in my experience, uh, burned out of you uh, by Microsoft over the years that you maintain your enterprise agreement. Um, but I think all of the customers, all of the, the cloud providers are going to have that same problem. There's an element to this as well, uh, you know, having been at big companies doing big procurements of SANs and, and, and server hardware and things like that. There's this... Uh, I guess the, a lot of the, the, the hardware companies and the software companies have built into procurement teams this expectation that you can get a 70 or 80 percent discount on your cost. You know, we used to have uh, I had a guy famously come to my office and tell me that he had a 100 percent discount authority <laughs> on, on his software, which I accepted immediately. You know, when when procurement shops are used to getting 70 percent discount off of list price and then Amazon is able to offer you a few percent discount or a 20 percent discount for paying in advance for a year or a 40 percent discount for paying in advance for three years. That's a, a big change to what they're used to. And again, it gets to the we're managing our costs in a different way. And that is with the help of, you know, with integration with the, the IT teams who were doing that work and with the integration of the business teams who were saying this is the value that that investment creates for our company. The perception is obviously a problem. I don't. I don't think uh, AWS or Google or Azure are, are unfair in their pricing. I mean, it, it, no, looks, it looks it looks really good on, on the surface. It obviously can lead um, through mismanagement to be to be expensive. But do, do you think there's more that those providers could be doing to make our lives easier? Oh gosh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, on the cost management side, I think that they're all taking good steps towards creating a better uh, environment for all of their customers. There's a lot of magic that goes into running a, a hugely scaled data center infrastructure like they are all doing. There's a lot that, uh, there's a lot of capacity planning. All the stuff that we used to do, uh, the capacity planning and the and the budgeting and the allocation and the the year over year development and the watching the performance and watching uh, latency and watching the network growth and all of those things that we used to do in our own data centers, they're doing at scale and they're doing so much better than any of us used to do. So uh, I think that they're learning as they go. I, I do think that they're passing through, you know, a, a substantial amount of, of the benefits of, of what they're of what they're able to achieve by by operating those things at scale. But certainly, there's there's more that they can do. I'm really happy about the savings plan released by by AWS. That's a great step in the right direction, introducing more flexibility to the way that you uh, can get those discounts. I think Azure will will come along with something similar. But GCP's discounting programs are uh, are very flexible, and so reward you for long running things. They also reward you for just you know your overall usage uh, in general. So I think that the I think that all three of them are taking steps to. Uh, to introduce discounts that are more flexible and that get people to where they need to be. Uh, but as cloud adoption continues and people learn to use the cloud more effectively, what we're trying to do is is instill some of the discipline in not just the development teams, not just the, the technical people who need to understand what all these new cloud services can do, but the finance teams and the procurement teams and the business teams who can then start to talk with them and, and, and work together to, to get the value out of it. One of the things I was pleased to see Google doing was their fixed price model for storage, where you you know you you basically commit yourself to a certain level, and they will bill you the same amount every month. And then at the end of the end of the year, you can't do a true up, and you either choose to uh, re up for the for the new amount or or not. And that sort of levels out the costs and makes uh, finance a little happier. I think it can. Yeah, it definitely has the the potential to do that. The trouble that can happen with some of those is that. I guess there's a real feeling on some customers' parts that like they're trying to get me, like right? There's they're they're creating that pricing model in some way that's gonna that's gonna end up screwing me in the end, and so without having that visibility and that understanding, you don't have any idea whether that's going to be a good pricing model for you or a bad pricing model for you. Yeah, and I'm sh I'm sure that the the experience that their customers have varies greatly depending on the scale at which you use it. I mean, if, if you're a small user, then it doesn't, probably doesn't make sense to, to commit to any, anything like that. It's, it's almost kind of the antithesis of on-demand pricing and, and cloud to, to, yes. pr to pre-commit. 
In a way, it is, and and uh, but that's one of the things that we that we talk about in FinOps is is that there are there are certain jobs that are the jobs of everybody in the organization, right? You need to be responsible. Every person in the organization needs to be responsible for their cloud usage. You need to take ownership for what, for what you're using, for what you're generating, the cost that you're generating, and you need to understand how that's going to reflect back on the organization, how it's going to be offset by the value you create. So every engineer who's who's launching services needs to be cognizant of that, and they need to use cost as a metric in the same way that you use performance as a metric or availability as a metric. And so those teams are, are, are needing to keep focus and keep eyes on that um, to, the, to the extent that we've even had some customers who, you know, sort of drop in these, uh, these cost optimization uh, points into sprints. So, so uh, an engineering team who may be uh, less efficient than others might just get some points in their, uh, in their upcoming sprint to focus on doing cost optimization stuff in their, uh, in their environment. But there are also jobs that, are the, that, that should be handled by a central FinOps team, right? So rate negotiations and reserved instance planning and savings plan planning, the, setting up the, the, the parameters for how an organization is going to buy there. Do you want 70% coverage? Do you want 80% coverage or 90%? There are a lot of decisions that go into that, and there's a lot of complexity to the billing models that are available. We talked before the show um, about some of the cost-saving efforts that, that we've been making. Mm -hmm. We built a tool that we called Thor's Hammer, which shut down every single instance in every development account, and we required people to basically power on the stuff that they still used. After six weeks, we terminated things, and we saved an enormous amount of money. I mean, I think, um, I don't remember the exact count of it, not instances, but th th sort of things like that. And that, that was performed centrally, and we sent out email notifications and things. But the waste, which was invisible to us, Mm -hmm. um, was absolutely fantastic. And not, not just unused instances, but uh, EBS volumes, which had been created and then not deleted along with the instances when people had played around in the console, mm -hmm. uh, you know, provision diops volumes that, that were totally unnecessary. Um, we've converted a lot of those things to GP2 volumes, but, but larger, so they get the same performance for a fraction of the cost. It's, um, I think visibility is, is super important, but I, I I think there's definitely still place for you know active responses to waste. Absolutely, and and it, it's a funny thing because my wife uh, does uh, sales operations for a large consulting company. A lot of the KPIs and the metrics that we talk about in cloud are focused around reducing waste, right? You don't want to waste your the resources that you're running. You also don't want to waste the RIs that you have. So you, there's a lot of areas where you really are focused on stopping waste or stopping bad behavior. There's a lot of talk about shame back. You know, we can charge back a lot of this cost, but there's a real value to being able to shame back to a group that's obviously wasting money and not turning things off. When when you have visibility to something and you don't turn it off, what, what can you call that other than you're just wasting resources? So it's a um, it's a very negative uh, sort of KPI that you that you do when you when you brand somebody a, a resource waster. <laughs> and my wife was sort of horrified because I guess salespeople you can't you can't give too many negative KPIs to where they get disheartened and and uh, ineffective. On the engineering side, inefficiency is a real horrible thing uh, to bear. And whether that's inefficiency in cost or inefficiency in, in availability or reliability, it's an important metric for everybody to have visibility to. But you you point out a great uh, a great point. There's there's not much that a finance team could just do with all that visibility if they didn't know the difference between an IO and a GP EBS volume. Yeah. If I don't understand what the difference is between those two things, just knowing that I'm spending this much on one type of EBS volume and this much on another doesn't really do anything for me. It's really building that knowledge between all of the members of of the team who are responsible for. Uh, for managing that cloud usage that, that creates the value. You also realize very quickly how fast your developers don't understand how their application performs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, they want they want a certain instance size because that's what they ran on premise. And it's like, well, but on premise you had VMware and you were able to overcommit resources on CPU and memory and all these things. And so I didn't really care. But now that I'm actually paying for this menu, this, this <laughs> server uh, on an hourly basis, the fact that you're only using three percent CPU and half the memory is a problem. Uh, but you know, they don't really understand always how those those knobs work, right? And like, if I reduce the memory, then what does that actually do to performance the system? Or if I reduce the CPU, how does that impact the performance? And you find that a lot of companies have not been looking at performance engineering in the right way, have not been investing in the right type of tooling there. How do you tackle some of those challenges? That's a great question. And and it really comes to the, to the centerpiece of, of FinOps overall, right? All of those teams have to collaborate. And the biggest thing, the biggest value that most FinOps teams can bring to any organization is to simply be able to ask those questions clearly 
and openly and with credibility. Every engineer is not going to be, you know, your ace cloud engineer. And, and just like every finance person is not going to be your, your best finance person. Um, by building those kind of common skills and building a common common language and, and understanding each other's motivations and really dealing with things in an open and transparent way, uh, a lot of times a FinOps team can go to uh, an engineering team that's struggling or that's not showing up as efficient. Uh, and rather than the traditional beating that you might that an engineering team might get from a finance person coming in, they get a conversation. So you can come in and have a conversation with an engineering team and say, are you, you know, why is this utilization so low? Is there a reason for that? Uh, is there anything that we can do to, to increase that? Or if it's uh, so low and there's a good justification for it, that tells me as a, as a member of the FinOps team and lets me communicate to everybody why that's valuable to the, to the company, right? We're spending this much money on it. And we're spending that much money for a really good reason because it's generating value for the company. Well, some of the feedback I've had from from engineering teams is that they get a lot of mixed messages. On one hand, we talk about auto scaling and serverless and demand driven compute. And on the other hand, we talk about RIs where we're committing to running these things for very long periods of time. And I think I think it's it's difficult to know exactly where on that scale you should you should land. I mean, how many RIs? Should we buy, and how much should we leave as um, a sort of flex that we can do with auto scaling, knowing that we're going to pay a higher rate for it overall? But um, I, I don't know it's it's difficult to to come along with both messages and and be understood. I think it is, and and the and I think as as engineering teams adopt auto scaling architect you know scale architectures that can auto scale or architectures that are built on containers, which can tend to aggregate uh, more stuff onto fewer underlying infrastructure pieces, that problem gets a little bit better. But, you know, again, going back to, to the, the separation of duties, a central FinOps team really ought to be the one who's managing the level of commitment and the reservations and the savings plans. Savings plans really does make that job a whole lot easier on the in the AWS world because it allows you to flow that discount across regions and across family types and things like and across operating systems. Um, but uh, the engineers really ought to be focused on the usage and they ought to be focused on making sure that whatever they're buying is sized correctly, that they're using what they're buying and that they keep that efficient. If, if I'm running a FinOps team at, an, at, at a big company and my engineers are managing their usage, then I can take on the responsibility for managing that the rates and the discounts that we're getting overall and together we'll build better and better uh, financial impact for the company. Yeah, I got a really good example about appropriate sizing of instances. I, I was involved in migrating a corporate web service from uh, private data centers to AWS for high availability and just ease of maintenance in general. It was just the right mm -hmm. thing to do. In VMware, I believe we had four very large instances, 16 cores each and 64 gig of RAM serving a website. When I did the migration to AWS, I, I put two instances in Virginia and two instances, two instances in, uh, in Oregon, and they were both uh, two cores eight gig of RAM and they perform absolutely perfectly. So uh, I think definitely realizing that things don't map e equally between uh, on-prem and in the cloud is, is probably one of the most important cost-saving lessons that we've learned. Yeah, absolutely. There's no linear scale to it either. It's just something that you really need to feel out. Engineers don't change immediately when they move out of the data center either. So that tendency to over-provision just in case um, is, uh, is, is always going to be there for, for people who are just starting out with the cloud. But one of the big things the variable cost model does for you and the, the, the availability of all the different instance types in the cloud providers is that you can try things, right? It allows you to experiment really quickly and see what the impact of that is. We've had customers who've built entire uh, automation scripting around their right sizing recommendations. So the right sizing recommendations we produce in Cloudability then go into a process where it will, it will automatically uh, resize instances and then measure their performance in the new configuration. If they're seeing problems with the way that stuff looks, they'll revert it back. There's a lot of things you can do in a really mature organization to drive that kind of behavior. And, it, and it's really exciting to be part of some of that. How do you respond to uh, my favorite question? How do you respond to uh, an executive who's concerned about AWS increasing the price? Because I, I get this question more often than I care to. <laughs> and I always, I always laugh when they ask it, but I'm curious how you take it. So the fear is that AWS will, will suddenly stop reducing prices for everything and will begin to raise it's prices. It's a very typical CFO type level conversation or a, a finance executive who's like, well, you know, yeah, we get a really great deal right now, but you know, when they're dominant in the market, they're going to increase the prices 10x. <laughs> and sure. then, you know, we won't be sure. able to afford this. And I, and I always think like, well, that's, you know, you first of all, you don't understand Amazon's uh, customer focus mentality and value prop. But uh, beyond that, there's, that's an interesting question. What do you think about it? 
I also have difficulty uh, responding to that. I mean, the, the historically, that hasn't borne out. Amazon as a, as a whole company has had a focus on providing the services that they provide in a uh, in a model where they make a reasonable and, and, and predictable margin and they, they pass on the biggest value in order to gobble up market share. I think they're, you know, it's arguable that they're already the dominant player in this market, um, and yet they have continued to reduce cost overall. Cloud is probably only about 4% of IT spend uh, globally, so uh, we're getting a little bit more visibility into that now that uh, Cloudability and Aptio have, have combined. Um, and I think there's still a huge, a huge market out there for cloud to, uh, to, to take up more IT spend. It, it's a, that's a really long-term problem that I, I just don't see a thing that would keep me up at night as a CFO. It's kind of like the vendor lock-in question, which, which I always laugh at when people ask, you know, the same, I guess it's vendor lock-in for, for finance in a, in a way. There are an increasing number of tactics that you can take or strategies, I guess, that you can take as well that would allow you to have a successful multi-cloud strategy, for example, to avoid some of that vendor lock-in and the use of containers, you know, Kubernetes flavor containers uh, would potentially work on all three clouds. But really, you're not, you also have to look at the short-term cost or the, you know, the the, the between here and the, uh, the thing that's probably not ever going to happen. Uh, between now and then, I'm going to be paying for uh, different teams to have different skill sets to build different deep expertise and different cloud providers uh, just for the, the the sake of of an eventuality that probably will not come to pass. I'd agree. I mean, I, I've worked in regulated industries, you know, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, and finance now, mm -hmm. and just the awareness of the of the time and effort um, and cut and money that goes into meeting compliance requirements, you know, auditing. The governance around um, and account management and everything else. The the thought of actually having to duplicate or or triplicate that effort to yes. in, in in many clouds must far outweigh any. Oh, I would say any reasonable risk of uh, of price changes. Yes, right before this job, I spent about a year doing um, doing CNA certification and accreditation cases for for the Department of Justice, and that was a an enormously labor intensive and difficult process just for one environment. And then imagine having to do that, yeah, as you said, for for well, if we push this button uh, to relocate the application to uh, from from AWS to Azure, then all of these other controls would have to come into play, and being able to document that effectively or have the ability to to defend something like that from a cybersecurity perspective perspective or being able to operate a system like that is just an enormous task. So if you uh, are listening to this podcast for the first time and you're looking at a very angry CFO who's upset with you uh, about how much money you guys are spending in the cloud, uh, how would you recommend they tackle the, the very first start of cloud cost optimization? What's your, what's your prescriptive first three steps? That's a great question. So I guess step one would be to go out and join the FinOps Foundation. That would be the that would be the, the first the first starting point. Getting the perspective right when you're facing that problem uh, is probably the most critical thing you can do first off. And this is where I would say most companies start doing FinOps, right? When, when the hammer comes down and somebody says, we're spending too much on cloud and we've got to stop. And that not only stops some of the cloud costs or all of the cloud costs, but it also stops some or all of the innovation and the development that's going on. So everybody takes a break, and there's a lot of there's a there's a big lag in what we're delivering. Product teams are not getting a a, a relaxation of the requirements that they're trying to trying to meet, right? So they're still trying to pump out uh, product. They're still trying to pump out value for the company, and they're having to wait uh, now for processes and things to get in place. So first off, would be kind of getting uh, all of the stakeholders that are involved in that finance, IT, and the business people, the product managers and owners of the of the different products who are being developed to get together and understand that they've got a common shared problem and they've got challenges that they can do, that they can face together. And, uh, and the FinOps Foundation provides a framework uh, to do that. So that would be the number one thing is kind of getting a common understanding of the problem. Secondly, I think is getting um, the, the, the basic visibility to the cloud spend in place for everyone, for all of those stakeholders. Uh, because typically that's the thing that's missing when we have these kinds of surprise. We're spending $300,000 on cloud and we didn't know about is that there's no visibility to that. And so engineering teams may not have visibility to the fact that they're spending so much money 
as in your case, they may have dev, you know, dev environments that they haven't been using for a long time that are just sitting out there running. Um, or they may have, uh, they may be using services that are more expensive than they expected that they would be. So getting that visibility built is the number one uh, case. And then there are usually some quick optimization wins that can be done by a centralized FinOps team. Uh, we typically find that when we start working with customers, they have very low reserve coverage rates, uh, extremely low. In fact, we've had we've had some customer meetings, you know, where the, the CIO will say, well, what's the one thing I could do to to reduce my cloud cost or to do my cloud infrastructure better. And we're like, end this meeting right now and go buy some RIs. You should own more than 18% coverage in reserved instances. <laughs> and, and a lot of times that's because they're just not sure. They're not sure what to do. They're, there's a lot of confusion about how to do that correctly and whether it's the right thing to do. And so, you know, we, giving that visibility uh, makes everybody a lot more comfortable with being able to take then the easy steps uh, to do optimization. And all of the FinOps practices are really incremental. They're all sort of flywheel based, right? You want to go in, inform the, the people who are doing the work. Uh, you want to look for optimization opportunities, and then you want to operate uh, those, you know, build those into your operation. And then you want to do that over and over again. So you do a, a kind of a crawl, walk, run model with this, do some simple low hanging fruit things, get comfortable buying a small non-controversial amount of reserve coverage, see how it affects your cost, then do it again the next month. And you'll get better at that every time that you exercise that flywheel. People get scared off when they think about committing to two years or three years worth of uh, expense. I mean, you obviously get the best deal if you pay up front for those, for those things. Mm. But I did some, like, some fairly deep modeling on um, at, at least at our usage, we have thousands and thousands of instances. And what, what I realized, the best way to sell this is don't think of it as committing to two years. I mean, after seven months, you're going to break even. And any and usage after seven months, you're making money at that point. So if, if you think you're going to use it for even half of the term of the RI purchase, you're most likely going to be better off to, to buy it than not. Yes. yes. It is unfortunate in a lot of startups, though, where this, this is a difficulty for them because where cash is king in a startup, um, outlaying cash is somewhat problematic, but they want that, that big discount. So that's I was at a startup for a while that that was a struggle was, you know, Okay, Mr. CFO, I can save you this amount of money, but you're going to have to put up this amount of money in cash. And it always came down to I'd rather hold on to the cash for other needs and rainy day concerns than to save this money, uh, which is sort of unfortunate. But um, you know, it, it is a reality some companies have to deal with. Um, yeah, but I mean, AWS. I mean, that's the beauty of the the advanced uh, discounting features that AWS is offering at least now, and yes, that, and the sure. Google commits uh, uh, offer is that you can do that with no money up front, right? I can. I I can build a, a a model where I say just buy you know this it's twenty five percent of your of your on demand coverage buy it for a year buy it no upfront buy it convertible uh, and the savings plans are even more flexible than that and if you buy that really the only risk is that you stop using AWS sometime in the next seven months are you going to stop using AWS altogether? in the next seven months? And if the answer to that is, of course not, especially if you've already got some kind of a custom pricing agreement with them, then you know you're committed to using it for that period of time. There's a, there's really zero risk in, in, in taking that extra step and reserving the coverage for what you need. We have the benefit of knowledge, right, of, of knowing this and having done it a bunch of times and being comfortable with it. It is really a scary thing for a CIO coming into it or a procurement person, even worse, coming into it not knowing how that's going to affect things, not knowing what kind of risk they're signing up for. So that's that's a big part of what a FinOps team does, and it's a big part of what we do as uh, as FinOps principals is is going in and helping these big companies mostly uh, learn how the, the this, these processes work and learn how to put the to evaluate their options and learn how to exercise those options within the guardrails of their of their existing uh, processes. So it's explaining to finance teams what an RI is and how it works or what a savings plan is and how it works, helping them to decide, do I pay all upfront, partial upfront or no upfront? That really comes down to the net present value of your, of, of that, of those deals versus your internal cost of capital. So there's a lot of analysis that we can do with a finance person and just being able to translate it into their language, into the, the, the processes and the evaluation steps that they go through for their normal purchases it really is it goes a long way towards getting them on board with some of these things and getting them in tune with what the uh, what the IT people are trying to do. So do you work directly with customers as well as providing the tooling for them to use themselves? How does um, how does Aptio go about enabling customers to uh, cost save? 
We do. So Appio acquired uh, Cloudability earlier in 2019. And uh, and so uh, the Cloudability platform is a, is a fully SaaS-based uh, platform that helps you to manage your cloud costs and really is custom built for the FinOps jobs that you need to do. So it gives you visibility into, it ingests your curve file, gives you visibility into all of the spending that you're doing. It allows you to uh, create uh, custom dimensions and metrics that allow you to divide your costs so you can do effective chargeback and show back to your organizations. It pulls in your tags and then allows you to standardize or normalize the way that, that those show up. And so it gives everybody in the organization uh, a view into their cost and a way to look at just their portion of the spend. So it really tackles that that key principle of everyone taking responsibility for their own cloud usage. And it also uh, then integrates with the, the broader Aptio set of products. So Aptio actually has a similar origin story with their uh, total business management or TBM uh, foundation, which, the, which they started uh, many years ago, which focuses on overall IT cost optimization and overall IT financial management. So the Aptio products really focus on looking at not just your cloud costs, but they pull in information about your licenses and your uh, labor costs and your facilities costs and your li- uh, uh, everything that you spend uh, in IT to do your job. And, and cloud costs are just a part of that. So the integration of our, of our two product sets has been really powerful for companies who are using one or the other to be able to expand and really take a, take a good look at what they're spending on cloud and be able to use FinOps to do the fast cycle, tactical, very prescriptive things that you need to do in buying RIs, in right sizing, in tracking anomalies, uh, and in getting visibility to that very complex data set of your cloud bill. But also then to take a, a, a broader look at what are all the costs that we're bearing and how do all those things uh, add up to uh, the costs that, that it costs us to, to deliver value to our customers. Well, thank you very much, Rob. That's been really educational. I think I've learned a couple of things. Where can they find you uh, on the internet uh, to get some more of this amazing content? If you'd like to, to talk to me more, um, the CloudPod uh, Slack channel would be a great place to do that. Uh, also, I recommend anybody who's interested in this topic, even if you're not doing it right now, to join the FinOps Foundation at FinOps.org. There is a FinOps Foundation Slack channel where I'm uh, very active. And uh, if you're interested in getting certified as a FinOps practitioner, we are going to be doing, the FinOps Foundation is going to be doing uh, a number of workshops this year. We'll probably do around 20 workshops in 2020, uh, not because those numbers match, but just because that's how many we're doing. Uh, The first one's coming up in London on February 5th. We're doing another one in beautiful Iowa City, Iowa. And at the end of February, we're doing one in Seattle shortly after that. And then we'll be doing one in Berlin after that. So out on the FinOps.org website, you'll be able to see when we're doing those. That's a certification workshop that's followed by a certification exam. And uh, I I teach a lot of them. So you get to meet me in person. Fantastic. Are you going to be uh, in the Bay Area at all? We will almost certainly do one in the Bay Area for uh, in, in 2020, but I don't have one scheduled yet. Well, when you get it scheduled, do let us know. We, uh, we might come check it out. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan has the certification bug right now. He's certified at reInvent, so he's uh, all awesome. about certs. And uh, I would I would probably enjoy a FinOps cert as well, so I might uh, definitely check that out. Well, again, thank you for coming and joining us here on the show. And uh, like I said, I think we, everyone learned a little bit here about FinOps and uh, this, the journey of uh, cloud managed cost management. So Thank you, and thank you for everything you do with the podcast. I really enjoy it. Visit thecloudpod.net to subscribe to the show, join our Slack channel, or sign up for our weekly newsletter. You can also find information on reaching our audience through a CloudPod sponsorship opportunity. A big thank you to today's guest, and thank you for listening.